John chapter 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The title of the sermon tonight is, They Shall Never Perish. They Shall Never Perish. It's my third sermon, my third and final sermon on salvation. Okay, my third and final sermon on salvation. I don't want to spend time on any more sermons on salvation moving forward from this. Okay, but there are three main things you need to cover in this day and age when you're preaching on the gospel. Even though we know the simplicity, simplicity of the gospel, we know that Jesus Christ paid it all and that it's by grace through faith and not of works. Yet I still have to spend three sermons on it. Right. The first sermon just um, explaining why it's by faith, why it's on the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The second sermon dealing with the topic of repentance and the false teaching that's out there that tries to add works behind the scenes to salvation. And now we need to cover the topic of eternal security. They shall never perish. Once you are saved, you are always saved. You never need to doubt about it. You don't need to doubt and say, God, maybe you've taken away my salvation. Or God, you know, uh, maybe I'm still on my way to hell. No, if you place your faith on Christ, you can be assured of this. This is a promise that Jesus gives us there in verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. Guys, it's eternal life given by Jesus Christ. And they shall never perish. I mean, the fact that it's eternal life already means you can never perish. But it's like Jesus has to repeat it. Just to clarify a little bit more. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So when we're saved, we're held by the hand of who? The hand of Jesus Christ. Your salvation is not dependent upon you holding on, but being held by Jesus Christ. Look at verse 29. My Father which gave of them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So you're eternally secure, eternally secure in the hand of Jesus Christ, and then above that hand, the one that's greater than all, the Father, you're safe and secure in His hand as well. I mean, even if you had the fear that Jesus might let go of me, hey, the Father's still holding on to you, okay? Both Jesus Christ and the Father is holding on to you. Once salvation is received, it cannot be lost. I mean, this is the great promise. This gives us great, uh, the burden just rolls off our back, knowing that we're eternally secure on our way to heaven. It's going to make you more bold as a believer, okay? If you still have doubts, you're going to be limited in how you can serve the Lord. You're going to be limited in your confidence in this salvation that God has given us. So the first thing I want to do as we go through this topic is just give you... How many reasons do I have here? I think it's eight reasons. I want to give you eight reasons why you cannot lose your salvation. Eight reasons, okay? And uh, obviously the first one, very clearly, as we saw in that, that passage right there, is that, in, especially verse 29, okay? And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand okay now one of the things that i often hear when i go door to door solely and i bring up this topic of eternal security they'll say yeah okay god will not let go of you but you can let go of god okay you can let go of god but what did verse 29 just tell us you know we don't need to get too complex on this we just have to believe the bible by faith once we're in the father's hand it says no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand now, that includes you, unless you're God, okay? Obviously, you, who have put your faith in Christ, you are but a man. And it says that no man is able to pluck them out of the Father's hand. That includes you, okay? So even if you were lacking in faith, you know, you were backslidden, you got out of church, you know, you stopped reading the Bible, all these kind of things, once you're in the Father's hand, there is no man that can take you out of that hand, including yourself. Okay, uh, look, if you think you can be removed out of Jesus' hand and the Father's hand, you're essentially saying you're more powerful than God Himself. Right? Your grip, your, your release is greater and more powerful than God Himself. And such, it's such a ridiculous thing to think that you can be taken out of the hand of God by your own strength, knowing full well that you're being held by Jesus Christ and by the Heavenly Father. So reason number one, guys, is that no man can pluck you out of, out of God's hands. No man can pluck you out of Jesus' hand. No man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. Now, please turn to John 3, 16. John 3, 16. Okay, John 3, 16. Actually, John 3, 15. John 3, 15. Okay. Let's have a look at these two verses. 
John 3.15, the Bible reads that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, okay, but have what? Have eternal life. Okay, you see that word? Eternal life. If you've, you've put your faith in Christ, you've believed on him, you have eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. What's verse 15? Eternal life. What's verse 16? Everlasting life. God is telling us in two different ways how we can... It's called eternal life. It's called everlasting life for a reason. And those two words actually have slightly different uh, ways of explaining eternity. I mean, think about everlasting. You know, I guess if you get, you know, those that are experienced door to door soul winners, usually when we get to John 3, oh, this is what I do anyway, when I get to John 3 16, I ask them, what does it mean to have everlasting life? How long is everlasting? How would they normally respond? It's forever, right? It lasts, because it's basically in that word, it lasts forever. Okay, it lasts forever. But what does eternal mean? Is it just a synonymous word? Sort of. They, they are very similar. But eternal means it never ends. Okay, eternal means it never ends. Okay, so everlasting life is this idea. You know, you, you're sort of at one point looking forward. It lasts forever. But then eternal is kind of from the other point saying, well, it never ends either. It never ends and it lasts forever. God wants us to understand this life that He gives us is eternal and everlasting. It's called everlasting for a reason. Okay? And one thing that I've started to employ in, in, in how I go door to door soul winning, you know, when people give you the answer, yeah, it's by faith on Jesus Christ alone, and then you ask them, hey, can you ever lose your salvation? And they say yes, and I'll often ask them, well, how? And they'll probably say something like, well, if you, you, know, you stop believing or if you, you, know, you, you go into a life of sin, whatever that means, whatever, whatever those reasons are. I'll often just ask them, look, do you believe you have eternal life? Do you believe you have everlasting life? They'll often say yes. And then you just ask them that question. Well, how long is everlasting? And then they'll say forever. Then hold on. If you have everlasting life, how could you possibly lose it? It's called everlasting for a reason, right? It's called eternal for a reason. Um... <laughs> And uh, it, I'll, just, I'll just give you a, a little story. Um, so obviously, you know, our church up there on the Sunshine Coast is, you know, does weekly door-to-door soul winning. Well, there's a pastor that I respect. Right? He's, he's writing the gospel up there. But when he found out that we also, not only do we teach that salvation is by grace through faith, that we also tell them that they're eternally secure, kind of laughed at that and said, well, why are you teaching that at the door? Why are you teaching eternal security at the door? That's a doctrine they can learn later. That's a doctrine they can learn in the church. And what blew my mind is, and look, this guy's running the gospel, right? But what blew my mind was like, well, if you're not telling them that you're eternally secure, what gospel are you preaching? I, I mean, if anybody gets to John 3, 16, and I, look, I've seen many people, many plans of salvation, they all include John 3, 16, if you don't read Everlasting Life, what are you telling them at the door? What are you offering them at the door? Okay, or salvation. Well, how long is salvation? It's eternal. You know, eternal life is part of the gospel. You can't just put that away at some other time because it's eternal life that gives somebody the security to know that they are forever in the Lord Jesus Christ. That they can never lose their salvation. They're, they're on their way to heaven and have that security and that boldness in Jesus Christ. Let's look at reason number three. I'll get you guys to turn to Hebrews chapter 9, please. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 26. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. The reason you can never lose your salvation, reason number three, the reason why you have eternal life is because Jesus died for all your sins. Guys, he died for your past sins, he's died for your present sins, yes, the sins you've committed today, and he's died for your future sins, the sins that are yet to come, okay? And you will have future sins. Now, one teaching that's out there, guys, is that uh, salvation, uh, yes, they believe it's by grace through faith, 
But the idea is when I receive Christ, that's the moment that all my past sins have been forgiven. But now that I'm saved, I need to make sure I live a clean and holy life, you know, to take care of my future sins. That's the kind of ideas that some people have. That Jesus, that the moment I believe on Jesus is the moment my past sins are forgiven, but my future sins, I've got to take care of them. I've got to turn from them. I've got to overcome them. And I've often, I don't know if you've ever heard this statement from some people, where they say, well, maybe it's better to believe on Jesus Christ at my deathbed. Maybe it's better, just, just in my, my last breath before I die, to place my faith in Jesus, because then I know all my past sins are forgiven, and then hopefully I just die before I commit a future sin. Because right? they know they can't control their sin nature. I mean, that, that's just obviously ridiculous. Someone that's holding back from trusting in Christ to the deathbed, aren't going to believe in Jesus Christ at the end, right? Uh, I mean, to be rejecting Jesus Christ their entire life and then think they're going to believe in Jesus at their death, but it's not going to happen, right? Jesus Christ died for all our sins. Look at Hebrews 9.26. Hebrews 9.26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Yes, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth, was crucified, and paid for our sins. But did you know, according to the Bible, it says that payment was from the foundation of the world. It was from the very beginning. The effect of His shed blood goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, and all the way to the, to the last person that's ever lived. Jesus Christ's sacrifice is not this one-time period, but it is for all time since the foundation of the world. Now, you and I might not fully understand that. I don't fully understand that. How can Jesus Christ have come 2,000 years ago and yet His sacrifice was in effect since the foundation of the world? I don't fully understand that. But obviously, God, you know, Jesus Christ being God, being an eternal uh, being, He can do that. You know, that His blood was available to Adam and Eve right from the beginning, right? And of course, you need to understand when those Old Testament saints would sacrifice animals, it was just picturing the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The blood of goats and bulls could never take away sin. Okay, But it was that object lesson teaching them of Jesus Christ. That He would come, the Lamb uh, of God, to take away the sins of the world. Please turn to the next chapter there, Hebrews 10.14. Hebrews 10.14. Hebrews 10.14. The Bible reads, For by one offering He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You see that? For by one offering, that one offering of himself on the cross, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look, all your sins are covered. Okay? Your sins will be paid for once you place your faith on Jesus forever. You'll be forever sanctified. Okay? Because when you're saved, you have that new man in you. You have that new spirit which is perfect without sin, without a sin nature in Christ Jesus. Okay? And that man is perfected forever. Yes, we have the flesh, you know, we have this flesh, we have the sin nature in us, but that new man is always there. That new man is sinless, okay? And has been made righteous before in Christ. Let me give you reason number four, guys. I should have actually told you to keep a finger in John 3. Please go back to John 3. John 3. John 3, 6, guys. John 3, chapter, uh, verse 6. John 3. John chapter 3, verse 6. John 3, verse 6, guys. Look at this. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. What's the fourth reason that you're saved forever? Is that you are a born child of God. Once you have placed your faith on Him, you've been born again. You've been born of God. And the Father is now your Heavenly Father. You become a child of God. Right? But as many as received Him, to them gave Him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. If you've placed your faith on Jesus Christ, that makes you a child of God. That makes you born into His family. <coughs> Guys, and you know, we have some children here today, you know, parents, they've been born into your family. Now, if they grow up and become rebellious teenagers, they want to leave the house 
Oh, let's say, I mean, let's say they're just horrible kids, right? They say, Mom and Dad, I want nothing to do with you. I'm out of this house. And you may not see them for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Does that mean they're not your child? No, they're your child, right? It doesn't matter if they're a rebellious son. Okay? Now, hopefully, while they're in, that, in your house, as a rebellious <laughs> child, they get chastised. They get disciplined, right? And God himself... As your Heavenly Father will chastise you. He will discipline you. But no, no matter how far you go away from the Lord, no matter how backslidden you are, no matter how disinterested you are in the things of God, you are still a born child of God. Just like a, a little child cannot be unborn out of his family, once you're saved, you cannot be unborn out of God's family. You're His forever. You're a child of God forever. And no children of God will ever be damned to hell. Okay? You're going to receive the inheritance through Jesus Christ. That's reason number four, that you were a born child of God. Now, I want you to turn here. Let me have a look. Actually, I will get you to turn here. Please turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Let me give you the fifth reason why you will never perish. The fifth reason, <coughs> Philippians 1 verse 6. The Bible reads, being confident of this very thing. So be confident about this, right? It's right, right? He says, I want you to be confident about this very thing. That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay? Jesus Christ has begun a work in you. You've been saved. You've been born again. You have the Holy Ghost indwelling in you okay now he's going to continue working in your life okay even if you're a rebellious child of god the holy ghost will be working in you okay now how does that all come to be i don't fully understand that right but there will be some element of growth in your life now you might not grow as much as others that are serving the lord faithfully but the holy ghost here is going to be working in your life jesus christ will be working it says when until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, if you know about the end times, if you know what that day of Jesus Christ is, it's the day of the rapture. It's the day of the resurrection. The resurrection being when you get your resurrected bodies. Okay? Now, when you receive those resurrected bodies, remember, those bodies are sinless. They're without a sin nature. They're perfect. Okay? They're immortal. They cannot die. And so, if the promise here is that Jesus Christ will begin the work until that day of the rapture, when you have those resurrected bodies, that means you cannot lose your salvation because you're going to receive that new body, and that body will never sin. That body is perfect without error. Okay, that resurrected body will be just like the body of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, let me give you the sixth reason. The sixth reason, and this is a very basic reason, uh, it, it's, it, I'm not going to go too much in depth on this because we have covered this uh, in our second sermon. But obviously, reason number six is that salvation is not of works. Okay, your salvation is not of works. And quite often when you knock on someone's door and they tell you they can lose their salvation and you ask them, you know, how can you lose your salvation? They'll be saying something along the lines of, hey, you know, you're not living a, a holy enough life. You're not keeping the commandments of God. Or, you, you know, you, you lose interest in the things of God. And that's how they think you can lose your salvation. Okay? In other words, they're trusting in their works. They're trusting in Jesus Christ plus their performance to be assured of heaven. Okay? But we know, you know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay? So if salvation is not of works, then your lack of works is not going to get you unsaved. Right? Your lack of works is not going to get you unsaved because your works never got you saved in the first place. Okay? Reason number six is that salvation is not of works. Okay? And look, no amount of good works was enough to get you saved, which means not enough of bad works to get you unsaved. Because it's not based on your performance. Not based on your performance at all. And by the way, sin is contained in this sinful flesh. Okay? Uh, sin is contained in this flesh. 
not in that new man that Jesus Christ has given us. And we'll look at that very shortly. Uh, but reason number seven, let me give you reason number seven, is that the new man, the man that's born again, that child of God, is perfect and cannot sin. Reason number seven is that the new man is perfect and cannot sin. Okay? Now, let me just quickly give you, uh, I know I've covered this before, but let me just quickly cover this again. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 50 says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood can So this flesh that you're in, you're not going to go to heaven in this flesh that you're in. Okay? This flesh is sinful. It cannot take the kingdom of God. And so that's why God had to give us that new man. And that's why God promises us that new resurrected body so we can be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. I'll just quickly read to you. Actually, no, I'll get you to turn there. 1 John chapter 3. Turn to 1 John chapter 3 if you've got your Bible. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. The new man is perfect and cannot sin, guys. 1 John chapter 3 verse 9. The Bible reads, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. So let me just ask you guys, do you commit sin? You probably do. There's a hand. Okay, we've got someone admitting to it. We do. But it says there that we don't commit sin. But it says, whosoever is born of God. The new man, okay? The spiritual man in you cannot, does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. That new man in you guys is perfect. Even when this flesh sins, that new man remains perfect and pure. Okay? And so if this new man inside of me, the one that God has created, the one that was born of God, born of the Spirit, if that new man is perfect and cannot sin then it cannot lose its salvation, can it? Because it goes to heaven perfect in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It goes to heaven in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I've said this to you before. This, when you sin, it's in this flesh. Okay? It's in this flesh. I'm not giving you an excuse to sin. I'm not saying it's okay to sin. I'm just saying to you, when you sin, it's in this sinful flesh. And this sinful flesh was not going to heaven anyway. Okay? But you know what was going to it's going to heaven? The new man. When this body dies, the soul will leave the body and will be forever with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. Because it's perfect in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay? Born of God. It says, For his seed remaineth in him. There is a part of you that is the seed of God. And the seed of God, obviously, God cannot sin and is perfect. Now let me give you the eighth reason for this. The eighth reason that you cannot lose your salvation, and I'll get you to turn to this one as well. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. And this one might be a bit of a controversial one, but let me give you some, I'll probably expand on this a little bit. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 13. The, reason, the eighth reason why you cannot lose your salvation is because God cannot deny Himself. God cannot deny Himself. The Bible reads that if we believe not, yet He abideth faithful, He cannot deny Himself. Listen, you can deny God. You can get to a point where you have <coughs> doubts about God, that you get to a point where you even disbelieve. You no longer believe what you've been reading in the Bible. But if you've been truly saved, the Bible says that God cannot deny Himself. Because when you're truly saved, you have the Holy Ghost indwelling in you. You have God Himself indwelling you as that temple of the living God. And He cannot deny Himself. That's what keeps you perfect because you're in Christ Jesus. Okay? The Father cannot deny His Son. His Son lived a perfect life. You know, paid for the sins of the whole world. So even if you deny the Lord, the Lord cannot deny Himself, meaning that you're secure and safe forever. Okay? Now, one of the things that comes up with this is, if you look at the verse, if we believe not. Now, think about who's writing this. It's obviously the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, who's a pastor, a church pastor. So you've got an apostle and a church pastor, and it says, if we, who's the we? Paul and Timothy, right? Saved 
believers, people in a leadership position. He says, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. The question becomes, can a believer, can someone that's saved actually stop believing in, in Jesus Christ? Like get to a point where, you know, they want nothing to do with the word of God. Is that possible? Well, if we take this verse at face value, it's possible. But, and this is where it gets controversial a little bit. And let, let me explain a couple of things to you here, okay? Now, if you meet someone that says, Oh, I used to believe the gospel, but now I no longer believe. I no longer believe. Now, there's two options here. There's, there's one of two things. Uh, number one, and I think this is probably going to be the most likely case. Number one, they didn't believe at all. They, they just weren't, they, they weren't saved to begin with. You know, someone that says, look, I, I used to believe, but now I no longer believe. They probably won't even, weren't even saved in the first place. Because when you understand the gospel, when you understand that it's not based on you, on your performance, and it's based on Christ alone, and you have that assurance of salvation, it would take a really corrupted mind to get to a point where you're like, you know what, this is rubbish. You know, once you appreciate and understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, okay, they probably weren't saved in the first place. But that's not always the case, okay? Because there are people that I know of in my life that have believed the gospel, that could have quoted it to you word for word, and are now like out of church, not interested anymore, kind of thing. Now, I'm, I'm expecting these people, and they'll tell me I don't believe anymore, or something along those lines, okay? Now, again, could it be that they weren't saved? I guess it's possible, okay? But you know how it is. Obviously, if you're saved, you're saved forever. Okay? And even if you stopped believing, you would still be saved. Okay? Now, let me think about a few people in the Bible that we know of. Think of who's the greatest man that's ever lived according to Jesus Christ. It was John the Baptist. Right? John the Baptist. And if you remember the story when he was taken into, uh, when he was arrested and taken into prison, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus if he was actually the one to come. You know, John the Baptist was the one who proclaimed the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was the one that heard the voice of heaven say, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He saw the Holy Ghost descend on Jesus Christ as a dove. You know, bodily as a dove. John the Baptist witnessed some amazing things, right? And yet when he was arrested, he started to doubt a little bit. Right? Because he was going through persecution. He was going through difficulties. You know, He wasn't sure if he was going to live or die in prison. And so the doubts came. Right? And, and when you start doubting, it's, be, it's because you start, you know, you're, you're no longer 100% sure. You're no longer 100% confident. There came some disbelief in the life of John the Baptist for a period of time about Jesus Christ. So yes, it's possible to start to lose some faith. Does that mean he, he lost his salvation? Or well, does that mean he was never saved? No, he was always saved. Okay. Now, think of uh, the Apostle Peter. Remember when Jesus Christ was, was uh, arrested and uh, Peter came uh, following Jesus Christ to see what would happen to him? And three times he was uh, pointed out as being one of the followers of Jesus. Right? And they would ask him, you know, three different people asked him, Hey, you're one of those Galileans. Hey, you're one of the, the disciples of Jesus. And what did he do? He denied Jesus Christ three times. Denied him. Denied him. Denied him. Was Peter unsaved? No, he was saved. Right? But he was telling everybody else, I don't even know this man. I don't even believe in this man. I don't know who, I don't know who that is. You've got me confused with someone else. But then when the Lord Jesus Christ looked at Peter, he wept. Remember when the cock crew, he kept, got down and he wept. Okay? So here's what I, what, what I think can happen to a believer. A believer can have doubts, as we saw with John the Baptist. A believer can even lie to others and say, I don't even know, I don't even know this man. I don't even believe in him. Okay? But you, they're lying to themselves. Because a, a saved man has that new man in them. Okay? Has the Holy Ghost indwelling in them? You know, that's telling them that they're saved. That's telling them that the Word of God is true. And that they're in Jesus Christ. And, you know, I, who knows? Maybe if we go through some difficulties, obviously uh, the Apostle Peter was, was afraid, not knowing what's going to happen to Jesus, afraid that he might be arrested. And that put his faith on trial. And he failed three times. He failed three times, denying the Lord Jesus Christ, but he was still saved. 
But in, inside, he knew the truth. He knew that he believed in Jesus Christ. Okay? So, that's where the controversy is. If someone says, you know, I don't believe anymore. Yes, it's possible that they were never saved to begin with. But it's also possible that they are a true believer and they're just lying to themselves. Okay? They're lying to themselves about the truth that's in their hearts about Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, those are the eight reasons why you cannot lose your salvation. If you guys have some other reasons, let me know after the service. Okay? But let me just get onto some other things. Let me get onto some reasons people use to teach that you can lose your salvation. So I'll get you to turn to the book of Matthew, please. Matthew 24, verse 13. Matthew 24, verse 13. And this one gets brought up a lot, um, especially door to door. Verse 13, it says here, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So those say, see, the, the people that get saved are those that endure to the end. You've got to remain faithful. You've got to remain serving Christ. You've got to remain, you know, going to church and reading your Bible and living for Jesus, whatever that means. You know, they'll say these things and say, see, you've got to endure to be saved. Okay? Now let's have a look at this. The first thing I want you to understand about the word saved in the Bible is that saved is not always about your soul's salvation. Okay? Now, I don't know, like if someone's drowning and someone pulls them out of the water, wouldn't we say that they were saved? We would say they're saved, right? So when you read the word saved or salvation in the Bible, don't automatically think it's about the soul's salvation. It's not always the case. Look at, uh, let's look at uh, four verses back to verse number nine. Matthew 24 verse nine. Matthew 24, verse 9, it says, look at this. Then shall they... By the way, this is talking about the tribulation period. This is talking about the tribulation period in the future. It says, Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So just four verses back, before they, they endure to the end, what is the context of what we're talking about here? What salvation? What is in danger? Your life. Like your physical life being killed. Not your soul, salvation, but your physical life. Let's look at uh, verse 22. Same chapter, verse 22. And Jesus explains this further. It says, And except those, those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So what is it? If those days of tribulations aren't shortened, it says that no flesh will be saved, right? No flesh. So is this teaching, verse 13, enduring to the end for salvation, is this teaching eternal life, salvation of the soul? No. It's teaching about salvation of the flesh. Okay? Saving, uh, being uh, being um, a saved from tribulation. Okay? That you wouldn't lose your life during the tribulation period. So please keep that in mind. If someone throws verse 13 at you, you've got it four verses back. And then a few verses forward, verse 22, so that gives context of what that verse is about. Okay? Now, um, if you guys can turn to... Let's have a look at this. <coughs> yeah, Revelation. I'll get you to turn to the book of Revelation, please. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. The Bible reads, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And so these people that are trying to add works to the gospel, these people that are trying to tell you that you can lose your salvation, will always find some verse that they can twist. Right? And they say this about overcoming. He that overcomes, sorry, yeah, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. And I say, see, you need to overcome. You need to, and then they'll fill in the gaps. You need to overcome sin in your life. You need to overcome, you know, uh, not, not serving the Lord the way you ought to. You need to overcome in these areas. And yet the Bible tells us what it means to overcome, right? 
I'll get you to turn, actually turn to verse 11 there. Same chapter. Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. What's the second death? The lake of fire, right? Eternity in the lake of fire. So we need to be people that overcome. But again, how do, what, what are we overcoming? Those that are trying to bring works. You need to overcome sin in your life. You need to turn from your sins or whatever they'll say, right? Uh, look at uh, Revelation 21 verse 7. Revelation 21 verse 7. 21 verse 7. It says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Have you overcome? Have you overcome this world? Have you overcome sin in your life? And so they'll try to add these works. But of course, <clears throat> the answer is in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I'll get you to turn there, please. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. The Bible reads, For whatsoever is born of God, look at this, overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? Verse number 5. But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay? So how do we overcome? What is it that allows us to overcome the second death, the lake, lake of fire? It says there, Whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. If you've been born again, in verse number 4, you've overcome the world. Okay? And this is the victory that overcometh the world. What gave you victory? Even our faith. You know, our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the victory comes from. That's what gives us the ability to overcome this world. Okay? So, you know, please, you know, memorize or jot down 1 John 5, 4. Because this is what I see a lot as well. People telling you, hey, you've got to overcome or you won't do it. How do we overcome though? Salvation by grace through faith. Okay, through faith. Um, the Bible is 100% consistent. You know, all these verses they throw at you, you know, the, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, you know. You just read the context, you just look at uh, other verses talking about the same topic. But it was crystal clear that salvation is by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation is being born again, being born of God. That's what gives you the ability to overcome this world. Now, the, the final one, and I don't know if I should, you know what, I'll skip this. Actually, no, I'll be very quick. They'll say eternal life is still... The future, you know, and I've got a few verses here, but I won't read them all out. I'll give you the references and you can look them up later. But they'll say, we don't have eternal life now. It's when you die and God judges you, they'll say, that's when he may or may not give you eternal life. Okay, because, you know, as someone that believes once saved, always saved, that means we're essentially saying that as soon as you believe in the Lord, you have eternal life right now. Okay, it's not something that comes in the future. You have it right now. And uh, I can give you, I'll give you one verse, you know, John 3, 36, which says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. If you have believed on the Son, if you believe on Jesus Christ today, you have everlasting life right now, present tense. Okay, it's not something that comes in the future or when you pass away or at the rapture, Eternal life is received immediately. Okay? You're going to live forever. Okay? If you're saved, you don't have to be afraid of dying. You have everlasting life right now. Yes, the body will die, but you, the true you, the soul, the spirit, and one day with that future resurrected body will live forever. Some other references that talk about this is John 5.24, John 6.47, John 6.54. And... Um, I'll get you to turn to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 verse 10. 1 John chapter 5 verse 10. This is actually uh, an awesome passage. 
First John chapter five. If you got your Bibles, please turn there. First John chapter five, verse ten. First John chapter five, verse ten. Look at this. He that believeth on the Son of God <coughs> hath the witness in himself. So if you if you believed on, on him, there's a witness in you that testifies of these things. He that believeth not, so that believeth not God hath made him a liar. So how, what makes you a liar? It says, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. So do you see the one that is not saved, the one that believes not, does not believe the record that God gave of his son. So what is the record? What's this record that we need to believe in order to be saved? Verse 11 tells us, And this is the record, that God hath given us eternal life. That's the record you need to believe to be saved. That God hath given us, to us, eternal life. So those that think that, that they don't, that those that believe that they don't have eternal life right now, those that believe that eternal life is some future thing, have not believed the record. They've made God a liar and are unsaved. This is why eternal security is such an important doctrine to teach when you're giving someone the gospel. Because they have to believe that God has given to them eternal life. That means they have it right now. It's not something that they're going to attain in the future. And this life is in His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things have I written unto you, look at this, that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, <clears throat> God has given us this record. God has given us eternal life right now, so that we can know, so we can be confident that we have eternal life. You know, a lack of confidence is going to make you uh, just unable to serve God. Not knowing for sure. It's, it's just going to make you hopeless. You know, I, I gave you the example of Brother Michael. You know, we heard about him. You know, winning that soul in the Czech Republic. And now she's got the confidence of eternal life. She, she believes in Jesus Christ. She knows she's saved. But what's the pastor trying to do? What's these crazy people in the church trying to do? Trying to cause her to doubt her salvation. Trying to make her doubt that the record that God gave of His Son. That it's eternal life. That we have it now. By believing on His name. Uh, it, it's such a wicked thing. Such a wicked thing. Someone that's rejoicing about salvation. Someone that understands it's by grace through faith. Someone that believes it's eternal life. Such a wicked thing for people to turn around and try to make them doubt their salvation. You know... Have you ever, have you been there? Have you been in a place where you've doubted your salvation? Like, not sure, am I going to heaven? I mean, it's, it's a scary thought, right? It's a scary thought, not knowing, right? Not knowing, where am I going after this life? And even someone that has believed the gospel and still having those doubts because of other people, you know, I mean, what more do they need to do to be sure of heaven? You know, I mean, it's kind of like you're telling people, you know, you're still not, you're still not there. You're still not reached, you know, the, the level that you need to attain or whatever it is. You know, it's such a wicked thing. Now, I wanted to cover, I want you guys to turn to Hebrews chapter 10, guys. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Because, have you guys ever heard of the term fruit inspectors? <coughs> A fruit inspector. So, you know, when you... I'm assuming all of you guys go and buy fruits and veggies. And uh, before you put that fruit or veggie into your basket, don't you tend to have a quick look at it? You know, some people like to touch it or whatever, or have a look at it. You know, you want to make sure uh, that the fruit is good. You want to make sure that before you buy, purchase it, it's not like rotting on the inside, or, you know, it, it's going to last for a few days or whatever. That, that's, that's a good thing to be doing, right? When it comes to fruit... You know, buying something that's relatively fresh. And it's a good thing to be a fruit inspector in that sense, right? You're purchasing fruit. But there are some Christians that are fruit inspectors. Meaning that if you say you're saved, 
They won't look at your life and work it out for themselves if you're saved. Say, how? By, by asking you what you believe? No, no, no. <laughs> Not by asking you what you believe. By judging you by your works. You know, is this person going to church? Is this person interested in God? Is this person reading their Bible? Is this person overcoming the sins? And so they'll, they'll, they'll inspect, they'll fruit inspect that person to decide if that person's saved or not. And yet salvation is not by works, right? Salvation is by faith. Now, one, one phrase, and I don't know if you, you know, I've been in, in churches my whole life, right? And I've been in Baptist churches my whole life. And I've been in independent fundamental Baptist churches for about 14 or 15 years, you know? And one terminology that always frustrated me that I could never understand that they would always use is let's say someone calls upon the name of the Lord. It's like they're afraid to say that person's saved. So what they'll say is they made a, uh, a profession of faith. That's what they'll say. Right? So we know the Bible. You're either saved or you're unsaved. There's no in between. Okay? But some of, some of them will say, no, I don't want to say they're saved. I don't want to say they're unsaved. But we'll say they made a profession of faith. Okay? What, what does that mean? It means it's kind of like they're in this middle territory. Where we need to sort of fruit inspect them, we need to keep watching their lives, and then once we've seen their lives long enough, then we'll know if they're saved or we'll know if they're unsaved. You know, now, think about that idea. Think about that idea. You know, professional faith, isn't that putting a lot of doubt on that person? Like, you just, you have no doubts, you have no assurance that that person is really saved. That's the concept, right? Now, that statement you know, um, uh, uh, professional faith is actually found once in the Bible. Now I want you to look at the context of this. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. Look at this. 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Are we to have doubts about faith or are we to come in full assurance? You know, assurance is good enough. The Bible says full assurance. Assurance is not enough. Full assurance. We want you to be fully assured of your faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Look at verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Do you see how the Bible uses this phrase, the profession of faith? What is it? Being fully assured, holding fast, without wavering. Why? Because of us? No. For He is faithful that promised. We're trusting in Jesus Christ, who promised us that eternal life. If you have a professional faith, you tell me I've believed in Jesus Christ 100%, not of works, His death, burial, resurrection, I know I'm secure forever. That profession of faith, that's, what, that's what's going to hold you fast. That's what's going to tell me that you're saved. That's what's going to give me and going to give you the assurance of your salvation. It's not something to be doubting about. Let's put it that way. And so you can see how modern day Christians use this phraseology, not for the assurance, but for the doubts. You know, it, it's, it's such a wicked practice. Wicked practice to make people unsure of their salvation and be judging them of the works when it's not of works. Such a crazy idea. Now, one issue that I do want to cover very quickly. Have, have you guys heard of Calvinism? Calvinism? Alright, now, Calvinism teaches in a nutshell that when Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross, that he didn't die for all men. <coughs> Calvinism teaches that Jesus Christ came and only died for some. Okay, And those some are those that God had predestined to be saved. And the ones that he did not die for, God had predestined them to die and go to hell. You say, why would God do such a thing? Well, because he's sovereign is the word that we use. Because it's just, it's just God. It's just God's thoughts and his, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And uh, ultimately what they're saying is the reason someone is saved is because God wanted them saved before the creation of the world. Before God even, that person was even born, He wanted them saved. And that person's damned because that's how just God wanted it. 
And uh, I first came across, uh, I remember I was probably about 10 or 11 years old. The first time I came across Calvinism, I was attending a church in, in Chile. And uh, I had a Sunday school teacher. And um, I've only got one pen here, so I can't really use the analogy very well. But she grabbed a bunch of pencils. She, she had a bunch of pencils. She put them all out. She grabbed some pencils and said, aren't you thankful that God has saved us? Aren't you thankful that God chose you like I've chosen these pencils, that you would be one that's saved and that God would reject those other pencils and that you're not one of those? And I remember just as a child going, what in the world is this? You know, I was 10. I never heard of Calvinism before. No one had to tell me about any deep doctrinal things. But I heard this and it was so foreign that God would decide who would be saved and not be saved. I thought Jesus died for all men. I thought God was, was not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And uh, uh, that uh, annoyed me. I was angry as a child just hearing that. I, I knew it was heresy as soon as I heard it, right? As soon as I heard it. I didn't realize till I was later, oh, that's Calvinism. <laughs> you know, that there's this whole theology on Calvinism. Now, look, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that all Calvinists are unsaved. Because I, I got a lot of Protestants um, that call themselves Calvinists, they don't even know what Calvinism is. You know, they know that salvation is by grace through faith. Now, they might have some ideas. They might say, well, God gave you the faith or it came from me. Either way, they believe it's by faith and they don't, they don't believe it's by works and they don't believe they can lose it or anything like that. I, think, I personally think there's a lot of Calvinists that are saved. In fact, when I was in Chile last year, I went to a church that was so-called Calvinist. But when I looked at their statement of faith, and when I, when I talked to the pastor, when I talked to the men in the church, they were like, uh, we're Calvinists by name only. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, we don't really believe it, but because we're, we, you know, we, we're a denominational church, we can't just throw out Calvinism because the, you know, the denominational headquarters says you've got to be Calvinist. And so they had like the Calvinists, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Tulip, T-U-L-I-P, I won't go to all that right now, but they had rewritten it. And if I read it to you, you'd be like, wow, that's the gospel. <laughs> that's perfect. That's right. And so it's just interesting. There's a lot of churches, a lot of people that think they're Calvinists, but they're not. Because they believe Jesus died for all. They believe it's by faith alone. But one of the big issues with this tulip, T-U-L-I-P, is that final P. And this is basically their gospel, their doctrine of grace. And what they'll say with this P is that in order for us to be saved... You must persevere until the end. It's like what we read about, you know, that, that, that you need to endure to the end to be saved. It's that same ideology that you have to be faithful. You have to keep serving the Lord to be sure that you're saved. You know, it's kind of this idea that someone gets saved, serves God, is the best Christian, maybe becomes a pastor, serves in the church, wins souls, does baptisms, does everything that you think the ultimate Christian could do. But then at right at the end of their life, they'll be like, you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm out of church. And then they, they, they die. Well, to the Calvinist, that person was not saved. Right? Because right at the end of his life, he gave it all up. Right at the end of his life, he became backslidden. And so they'll be like, well, he wasn't saved. You know, and, and ultimately, those that believe in hardcore Calvinism... They believe in works. Ultimately, they believe in that you've got to attain a certain level to be sure of salvation, and you must do it till the end of your life. You know. So, all that to say this, I'll get you guys to turn to Second Timothy uh, four seventeen. Actually, yeah, Second Timothy four verse eighteen. Second Timothy four eighteen. I'll get you to turn there. And I, while you turn there, I'm just going to read to you from Jude 1. The Bible reads in Jude 1, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Are, do we, are we asked to persevere? No, the Bible says we're preserved. Preserved in Jesus Christ and called. So what I want you to understand is when you're saved, you're preserved forever. By your own efforts? No. You're preserved in Christ. Christ is the end of the law. He fulfilled the law. His righteousness is what preserves you forever. You guys are in 2 Timothy 4, look at verse 18. 
and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me. Who will preserve you? It said the Lord, right? The Lord will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hey, to his heavenly kingdom. You're preserved till you make it to heaven. Then you don't need to be preserved anymore because you're, you're forever there, right? You, you've got eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. And so it's not the perseverance of saints that gets you saved. It's the preservation of saints that gets you saved. And you're preserved because you're in Christ Jesus. It's not your own works. It's your faith in Christ Jesus that has you preserved forever. Okay. Now, how am I going with time? Can someone give me the time very quickly? Okay. I'll go a little bit longer. I, I, I won't, I won't uh, go through all my notes, but I just want to talk about this one thing. Because fruit inspectors really bother me. They really annoy me. People that think you can judge someone's salvation by their works. Okay? Now, let me tell you this. It's immature. It's carnal Christians that will judge someone by their judge somebody by their works. Okay? And what I have often seen in church, I'm talking about real life experience here with real people, is that they think because they've been saved X amount of years or whatever, and maybe they are saved, and maybe they have grown, and maybe they have overcome sins in their life, and maybe they're a, you know, uh, they're a model believer. Yes, you know, all these things are possible. But they get to a point where they think they've reached some level of attainment, and then those that don't, aren't, sorry, that aren't at the same level as they, they will look down at those people and say, I don't even know if they're saved. Because if they were saved, they would be more like me, right? This is such an immature thing to do, where one Christian would look at another Christian who's not at their level and say they're not saved. But you know what? There's probably another Christian that's more holy than they, that's more spiritual than they are, more righteous than they are, and that person might look at that one and say, hold on, I don't know if that one's saved, right? Very immature thing to do. And then there might be another person that's more spiritual, that's more righteous, that's more holy. And they will look at that one and say, well, I don't know if they're saved because they haven't reached my level of attainment. Right? You can see how this is, uh, this is horrible. Right? Now, let me tell you, is there a standard of goodness? <coughs> is there a standard of works and of goodness, standard of righteousness that I can judge someone's salvation by? I will say to you, yes, there is. Okay. Now, go to Matthew, uh, let's see, I'll get to turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5, please. Matthew 5, 48. Matthew 5, 48. I'll just skip some of my notes here, but let me just get the, co the, 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 the concept out here. Matthew 5, 48. This is the level of goodness. This is the level of righteousness. This is the level of holiness that if you attain, I know you're saved. Okay? Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven, which in heaven is perfect. That's the level you need to attain. If you reach perfection, I know you're saved. Okay? I know you're saved. Now, I don't care how self-righteous a man is, there's no way they are perfect. Doesn't matter how high achievers they are, how much they've kept the law, you know, they are not perfect. Okay? And so, yes, you need to reach a level of perfection to be saved. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says this, For he hath made him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Okay? So this is how you reach the level of perfection. You receive the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That's by believing on his name. By believing in his death, burial, and resurrection. You now have had your sins paid for by Jesus Christ. But you've also had his righteousness imputed upon you. And so when God the Father looks at you, what does he see? He sees perfection. As the, Holy, as the Father is in, in, uh, in heaven that is perfect. Not because you're perfect, 
but because the perfectness of Jesus Christ, <laughs> His righteousness is imputed upon you. When the God the Father looks at you, He sees you through the veil of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what makes you perfect. And so if you can tell me that, if you give me that profession of faith, that you have it on Jesus Christ, then you are perfect. You are perfect. Even if you've been saved for today. Even if you were saved today, I can say you have reached perfection because you've believed on Jesus Christ. Okay? So you can see how immature it is to be judging people by their works. They should be judging them by their faith. That's what makes them perfect. Faith on Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to wrap things up in two just very quick, quick ways here um, without going into too much detail. But when you knock on someone's door and you tell them about the freeness of salvation and you tell them that they can never lose it, the thing that gets a lot of people, um, especially Pentecostals, that gets them like this um, stumbling block is the idea, well, so what you're saying to me is what they'll say. What you're saying to me is that I can live however I want and God doesn't care. God just, he's happy for me to live however I want. Okay? And I can understand, to some extent, that concern. Alright? Because, you know, we're a church here. And I don't want, I mean, as your pastor, I don't want you to live however you want. Right? I don't want you to just go out there and live like the world and live like the devil and destroy your life. I don't want to see that. Right? And so I can understand the concern that someone might come and say, you're saying we can live however you want, okay? So the two things that you need to drive home to these people, number one, is that God does want us to serve Him. God does want us to keep the commandments, okay? And um, I've got verses here, but I'll just I'll, I'll avoid them right now. Just explain to them, right, the purpose of the law. Explain to them the purpose of keeping the commandments of God. Explain the purpose of having fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And, and, and asking Him for forgiveness in our lives after salvation. And that is to attain rewards in heaven. Okay? That is to lay up treasures in heaven and not lay up treasures on earth. Right? To put the righteousness of, of Christ first in our lives and His kingdom first in our lives. And God will add things in our life here, on temporal life on this earth. Tell them, hey, look, the reason why we do preach keeping the commandments, the reason we do preach holiness, the reason we do preach that you need to turn from your sins is not for salvation that's been paid for in Jesus Christ, but that we can attain rewards in heaven. Okay, because the truth is, when we go to heaven, it's not communism. Okay, heaven is not a communist place. Where God just divvies up equally everything and gives equally to everybody no matter what you've done for Him. No. Those that worked hard for God, those that served Him, will have the greater rewards for eternity. Okay? And then all the way down to the one that never worked for Him. The one that never served Him. The one that never tried to keep commandments and overcome sin. The Christian that lived just like the world is going to make it... He's going to make it because of Jesus. Okay? And, but his bank account's going to be very little. Okay? But still, it's better than hell being saved and having the righteousness of Christ in you. Okay? So this is a reality, guys. And we're going to get to, we're going to, get to heaven. And we're going to be look, looking back at our measly 70 years on this earth or whatever it is. And go, I wish I served the Lord more. You know, I wish I did more for Him. That's probably going to be the biggest regret that we're going to have. Right? Because... You know, you might say to me, Kevin, I'm just happy to make it to heaven. I've had people say this to me. I'm just happy to make it to heaven. Why do I need all those rewards? Look, you understand it when you get there. In fact, you understand it today. Why do people want rewards today? Right? Why do people work to achieve and accomplish and, and you know, make more money or, 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 or make something on themselves? It's because it gives great satisfaction. It's not going to be any different in heaven knowing that you've been serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And having those rewards for all eternity. I'd be, I'd be a bit embarrassed if I make it to heaven and it's like, well done, Kevin, but, you know, <laughs> you know, here's a piece of gold for you. <laughs> you know, I'd be a bit embarrassed, right? But, you know, we, we ought to be trying to serve him and, and uh, that's the purpose of it, okay? So we're not against works. We're not against keeping the commandments. We're not against overcoming sin. But we do it to please the Lord and earn rewards in heaven. 
And the last thing, I'll get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. We'll finish on this note. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. The Bible reads, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You know, if you're saved, the Bible tells us that he scourges every son whom he receiveth. Meaning that we're all going to go through the chastisement of the Lord. We probably already have in our lives. Somehow. right? The Lord has corrected us for our errors, for our mistakes. Verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So this is what you tell them at the door. You serve the Lord. You do good for him. Rewards in heaven. You please the father. You live like the world. You live like the devil. You destroy your life. God will be sure to bring chastisement upon your life. You know, and, and it's going to get to a point where it's clearly coming from the Lord. Clearly coming from the Lord. Now, that's a, it's a blessing to be chast- chastised by God. Because that means He wants you to grow and to mature. And not to remain in the same condition that you've been in the past. So, I'm just telling you these two things. Because if you've gone through the gospel with somebody, they've understood it. But they're really struggling. What you're saying, I can live however you want. These two things are important. There's reward for doing good. And there's punishment for doing wrong. But regardless, you go into heaven because it's a free gift by Jesus Christ. Alright, let's pray.